Welcome to the Assurology Show, a growth hacker's guide to human capital management with your host, Mike Vinoy. Each week, we bring you experts in human resources, employment law, accounting, benefits planning, and more to build productive organizations. You'll gain practical guidance for your business. You'll be alerted to the latest news and mega trends that impact small and mid-sized companies. We'll give you the hands-on information you need to stay compliant with ever-changing employment laws, the strategies you need to win the war for talent, and much more. So you can focus on what you do best, growing your business. Enjoy the show. Entity classification. The tax advantages of filing as an S-Corp instead of filing a Schedule C. Hi, I'm Mike Vinoy, Vice President of Marketing at Assure Software. Uh, th this is a really, uh, I think, wonky topic that a lot of entrepreneurs don't necessarily think about, but it's one of the easiest ways to add money to the bottom line by cutting out expense uh, from their business. Uh, you're going to have to hear it from a CPA to really unpack this information, but there's some, uh, most companies, most entrepreneurs, you know, they, they hang a shingle up for themselves. They are a great carpenter. They're great at doing hair. They're a great artist. They're great at whatever they do. And as they add employees, they're unaware of the tax ramifications of some of these decisions or may I say non-decisions. So, uh, I have the perfect guest for this topic today. Uh, uh, JJ, uh, the CPA, Joshua Jensen. Uh, JJ is a national speaker, author, practicing CPA with 30 years of public accounting experience. His YouTube channel, JJ the CPA, has over 79,000 subscribers, more than 6.6 .6 million views. Uh, JJ has authored two books. He's traveled over 50 cities presenting tax courses to thousands of fellow CPAs, uh, covering the latest tax laws and strategies. He's founded his own CPA firm at the age of 25 and still serves and advises his own private clients today. Uh, JJ also manages his life and disability income insurance practice, Jason, uh, Jensen Insurance. J JJ, welcome back to the show. Hey, thanks, Mike. I appreciate that. You're right. This is such an in, important topic. And what I love about Assure and what you all provide, uh, not only to your customers, but the business community at large is just basically putting a spotlight, spotlight on really important issues just like this. Yeah. And so a lot of what we talk about on this show, you know, it's really payroll centric. It's HR stuff, how to build greater, better teams, uh, be more productive, stay compliant in the process. Um, but this one is this one's kind of tax CPA wonky that I think uh, a lot of entrepreneurs miss because as they go from zero employees, they hang on the shingle for themselves. All of a sudden they start to grow and they become a 10, a 20 or 50 person company. Uh, they're unaware of some of those tax advantages for a different type of entity classification. So maybe, maybe before we start getting into specifics about why you should classify yourself as an S corp, can you even just explain what, what does entity classification even mean? And then let's kind of walk through the, 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 the most common types. You bet. So the biggest thing for most small business owners, and I'll be honest with you, even still today, I'm surprised that fellow tax pros, bankers, uh, other type of professionals that work with small businesses that really can't get this very beginning part straight, which is this. When you're talking about your legal formation, so what kind of legal entity are you? That is strictly with the state that you're in, with the secretary of state to be specific, and you're either an LLC or you're an Inc or you're a limited liability uh, uh, partnership. There's not that many really to pick from, but really think of it as that is then your start point and that's how your business comes alive. Then when you say entity classification, that is only then determined with how you plan to tax yourself or your business with the IRS. And there's really not that many to pick from. Uh, it really starts with if you're just basically a very, very small entity with very uh, little net profit, and maybe you're unsure if this is gonna be something long-term, you can be a sole proprietor filing a Schedule C. If you're a farmer, it'd be Schedule F. If you are then a uh, have at least two owners, you can be a partnership, um, or if you've got one or more owners, you can be an S-Corp 
or C Corp. So those are the entity classifications that you pick from after you determine how you want to be taxed uh, really at the entity level uh, in terms of your legal designation. And I'll just say this, if you're in Inc., well, then you can only be an S Corp or a C Corp. If you're a LLP or some kind of LP, limited partnership, well, then you can only be a partnership. Uh, what we recommend, and it works really in most states, and it definitely works in mine, is that you just simply be an LLC, which is a limited liability company. And the reasoning for that is that the IRS allows an LLC to be then taxed as anything from the standpoint of you fill out a form 8832 and you literally check a box of how you want to be taxed, whether it's a disregarded, which just means it doesn't file a separate return or an S corp that then requires you to take an extra step, which we'll talk about or to be a corporation. And then you start filing the tax return based on how you've selected your entity classification with the IRS. And then here's what's key. Whatever you elect to be taxed as with the IRS, then that's how you're going to follow the tax laws. So there's not laws specific to LLC or INCs or LPs because what the IRS looks at is, well, how are you taxed? So that's the biggest thing that I think people miss is they get caught up in getting confused on these two issues. But really, when you understand it, like we are talking now, yeah. hopefully it kind of clears the smoke and let you know kind of what you want to be focusing in on, which in my opinion is yeah. having legal protection. That's why you have the entity set up with the Secretary of State. But then what's going to yield the most tax favorable circumstances for the kind of business that you're in? And I think a lot of entrepreneurs, if you're the kind of person who is willing to take the risk of putting a shingle up for yourself and you start your own business and you're the you're the only employee, maybe sole proprietorship just that kind of resonates with your head. And so you think, OK, that's what I'm going to do. Oh, but you've also heard that you want to limit your liability. So I should probably set up an LLC, a limited liability corporation. Um, and it's more about I, I think most entrepreneurs understand the limitation of liability. We don't have to spend a ton, ton of time there. Um but no thought is ever given to the taxation. Um, so mm -hmm. I, I, we're going to spend the meat of our conversation on S corps and, and the taxation uh, 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 aspect. But I, I don't want to assume with too broad of a brush that this is automatically the right decision for everybody. Can you maybe uh, uh, unpack what would be some of the reasons why someone might, you know, you alluded to one, but why, why would someone be a sole proprietor? Is there a good reason to ever stay a sole proprietor, partnership, et cetera? Yeah. And the, the one thing I always tell people with even my own clients, if they're starting a new business is day one, step one, set up an LLC because you've separated that business from you personally. You've taken that first step to the liability protection. And as we just indicated, you can be taxed as anything. And so the next step is if somebody's just really starting the business, they're maybe not sure that they're going to continue it. They want to kind of dip their foot into the deep end and see, is there really a business here? Then I say, you know what, just be a sole proprietor, file a Schedule C and really remain that maybe until you're netting regularly, maybe more than 20, 30,000. And then you should start considering your other options. And the reasoning for that is that when you're a sole proprietor, that's filing a Schedule C, that would be an LLC, single member filing a Schedule C. There's lots of terminology that people come up with, but mm -hmm. at the end of the day, if you are filing a separate return and you become an S Corp or a C Corp, there's going to be a separate bank account required. Financials are going to be needed. There's going to be more sophisticated, basically tracking of your income and expenses expected not only by the IRS, but the banks and third parties that you may be relying right. on. And that all then equates to cost. Right. And so what it really comes down to with my clients is I say, Hey, listen, until you hit about 20 or 30,000 net, you're probably going to then basically pay self-employment taxes to the same amount that you would probably have expenses to take your business to the next level with the sophistication of doing something else. And so, like I said, many clients, their first year, we got them as an LLC. We filed a Schedule C. Uh, also, if you have a loss, you don't have to really get uh, concerned with what's called tax basis to allow the loss, which we'll talk about. But the biggest downfall, and I'll just put it that way, to a Schedule C 
is that you have zero control to the net income being subject to an additional tax in addition, and that that's exactly what I mean, to your regular income taxes. So if you're not a sole proprietor, you're not a business owner, you get your wage, interest, dividends, et cetera, you figure out what that income is minus standard deduction or itemized deductions, it arrives at taxable income and you pay regular income taxes on it. And then if you're a sole proprietor, you're gonna pay all that same tax. So whatever your business nets, you're gonna add that to it, you're gonna pay regular income taxes. But specific to a Schedule C, then whatever that net income is, there's gonna be a separate line item under other taxes, it's self-employment tax, and you're gonna pay 15.3% additional tax on that net as a sole proprietor, and that's gonna then add to or be on top of your regular income taxes. So if you were to net $100,000, let's just say for grins with a dual income, let's just say all in all, your income tax might be, I'm gonna lowball it, just call it, uh, maybe it's uh, 10 grand, maybe 10, 12 grand. But if you netted 100,000 also as a sole proprietor, in addition to that, you're gonna pay another $15,300. Now, it does cap out in uh, 2022, it caps out at 147,000, and in 2023 it goes up, and it's somewhere around 160,000. Self-employment taxes, Social Security and Medicare taxes, and I want us to remember that 15.3% because it's gonna come in key when we talk about S-Corps here shortly. But when we talk about that additional tax, the, the downside, as I was indicating, is not just that it's an additional tax, but you have no control, meaning whatever the net is, that's subject to that additional tax. So let's just go back to my example. Let's say somebody nets $20,000. Well, at 15.3%, that's going to be an additional $3,000 right. in these self-employment taxes. But if somebody then goes to the next step to make an entity classification with the IRS to either be a C-Corp, S-Corp, or partnership, there's going to be these additional costs with private parties, not with the IRS. And at best, it might save you then this $3,000 in self-employment taxes. So what I tell people is, well, don't go over here and spend three grand if all it's going to do is save you three grand in right. taxes. Let's wait right. until the business is off and running. And then when would you want to remain an S, a, a sole proprietor is you kind of have a side gig that you're going to net 20,000 or less. It probably yeah. just would make sense to continue to be a Schedule C. Yeah, yeah. Um, this might sound like a stupid question, but I, I, I'm certain there are some people in our audience. What is a Schedule C, right? So, uh, in, in difference between, what, so I guess what I want you to talk through is not just what is a Schedule C, but what is it about a Schedule C versus having a, a, like an S or C corp that is a separate entity that gets taxed, has different tax returns, what flows to your personal, what doesn't, in the, in the different scenarios. Yeah. So really simply a Schedule C is then just a schedule that's attached to your Form 1040. So it gets filed with your individual return, which more also is that you're not filing a separate and distinct tax return for right. your business from your individual return. And so the other attracted part to that is just that. It's like, well, I just put my income and my expenses I put it on this form, Schedule C, goes with my Form 1040. I don't have to file something separate. So when you're a C-Corp or an S-Corp or a partnership, then the business income and expenses are going to go on a separate and distinct business tax return that gets filed separately from your individual return. For a partnership and an S-Corp, whatever the net income is, then you will pay tax on that down at the individual level stated another way, there is no tax at the partnership or S corp level in terms of federal taxes. So the thing that I always point out to everybody is that in that example, I told you that if you were to net a hundred thousand, well, if you have two or more owners and you are electing to be a partnership and that partnership nets a hundred thousand dollars. And what's common is you would have two spouses that might own that partnership 50, 50. Well, right. down at the individual level, they're going to show 100000 in that net income, and they're going to pay income taxes on it just the same as Schedule C. Works just the same with an S-Corp. If that were to net hundred grand, well, because that S-Corp uh, has what's called a Schedule K-1, 
that then gets reflected and that owner, the individual, they're going to then pick up the hundred grand. So as you can tell, no matter where you have your business and how you elect for it to be taxed, someone's paying tax on that hundred thousand on the net. But the difference is with the Schedule C, meaning you haven't filed a separate and distinct return, well, then no matter what, whatever that net income is, is going to be subject to the self-employment tax. Just really quickly with a C Corp, many get uh, easily kind of in a daze because the C Corp does pay tax on its net income and that net income tax rate is 21%. So immediately anybody looking at this will go, wow, that seems like a much lower tax rate than my personal rate, so I want to be a C-Corp. The, the problem there is that the only way to get money out of a C-Corp is to pay yourself a dividend or wages. Well, if you pay yourself wages, you're paying regular income taxes on it, as well as then payroll tax, which employer and employee com combined is 15.3%. So that's not a reason to be a C-Corp. The other is if you pull money out as a dividend, well, it can be taxed as a capital gain rate, but Typically, that's going to be at least around 15%, and that's kind of a flat rate. Unless you don't really make any money, it could be uh, lower as a 0%, but most people that are business owners are going to be up in the 20% capital gain rate. So all of a sudden, the money that you pull out, you're paying tax at 20% at the individual level. Net investment income tax, if you make over 250, the individual level hits, so you're paying 23.8%, and then for the C Corp, it paid 21%. So all of a sudden you're looking at this and you're like, whoa, I've paid you know almost 45% in taxes. So for somebody that's less than typically in, in our opinion, uh, really less than maybe 10 million in net, really would never see a reason to consider being a, a, a C Corp. But of course there's people that can listen right now and have a whole bunch of reasons why you should be a C Corp. I'm just saying in general, one to two owner, 10 or less owners, you're netting less than 10 million, not really a great option there for you. So <laughs> really at the end of the day, then that's where we With a C Corp, is there an advantage over S Corp uh, for retained earnings? Like, so it's, it's, it's more expensive to pull the money out. But if, if you got, you know, you got a great business on your hands, maybe it's still under 10 million, but you're trying to build something big. You're trying to build a 10 million, a 20 million, a 50, hundred million dollar company that this, this is a, it's, it's tax beneficial to leave the money in the business and not be taxed. Am I saying that right? Yeah. So really the, thank you uh, for that clarification on that. So yeah, if somebody's coming to me and they're building something that they want to have a ton of owners and investors, and they're really just going to pull a salary out, they're trying to put something together to your extent of income Maybe they're going to go public. They really want to get this up and running and then merge or sell it. Meaning yeah. if they're not interested as in the owners of getting to that net income, then yeah, a C Corp can make sense. Uh, but most small business owners, you know, they're wanting to get a salary and then they're hopefully adding to their lifestyle by pulling out the net. But your, your great point there. So here's what I just say. You're going to have a lot of owners, investors, um, and you uh, and or you want to grow this to then sell it and you're not interested in pulling out a lot of profits, then, yeah, the C-Corp can start making a lot of sense. Yeah. OK, let's kind of. So I, I think we kind of covered the, the periphery. Let's let's narrow in here on, on S-Corp. Why? And, 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 you, and you've given a couple of use cases, but let's really break it down. What, why entrepreneurs should do it, you've, you've kind of said that, but then what do they need to do and what is the specific impact of filing, a, a changing entity classification? So I'm rambling here, but what do they first need to do to, to change classification? And then what do they need to do from a tax filing perspective? Then let's talk through some use cases about you know before, after impact. Yeah, so with an S corporation, Typically, if the client is going to be actively involved in their business, then the S corporation is really just a no brainer. And the reasoning for that is that the net income from the S corporation is not subject to this self-employment tax by law. But if for whatever reason, let's just go with at the beginning, you are a schedule C. So you're not filing a separate return, but you are an LLC. Then 
There's a form 8832. Again, it's a check the box. It's actually says at the top entity classification and you would follow the instructions, which are pretty straightforward and check the box that you now want to be taxed as a corporation. And then you would then file a form 2553. That's a separate form with the IRS. Again, pretty straightforward. But the form 2553 says, well, I want my corporation to be taxed as an S corporation. Now, I'll just tell you this. If initially at the very beginning, you're just going to out the shoot be an S corp, then the IRS does allow you to just skip the step of the form 8832 and just file a form 2553. But I'm going to give a caveat to that, Mike, because about 50% of the time, if we follow the steps that the IRS tells us, we may get a letter back from the IRS that says, oh, you got to file form 8832 as well. So <laughs> I'm just telling you what the IRS instructions say to do. And with that, uh, once you become an S corporation, then you do have to remain an S corp for five years. Uh, that's where you're tied into that. And then you're off to the races. Now you will need to file this separate return, which is a form 1120 S. And uh, that is then where you report the income and the expenses uh, of the business. Okay. So the average entrepreneur, they start uh, uh, as some LLC, but not as a uh, uh, sole proprietor partnership, some LLC not classified as S corp. They file the appropriate paperwork uh, either on their own or presumably through a CPA uh, like, like yourself. I, I think we should probably note folks listening. Don't, don't be scared. JJ it, it amazes me the way he rattles these uh, <laughs> not just forms, but uh, which specific questions and IRS FAQs off the top of his head. Uh, you don't have to know all this stuff. Your CPA is going to know this stuff for, for you, right? Um, so, uh, but the point is here, hey, get re file the, the proper paperwork to, to reclassify as an S Corp. Okay, now I'm classified. What do I, what are the requirements that I need to go through that are beyond just, okay, now I have a corporate tax return and my personal tax return. There's some other things that involve payroll uh, to make this a, a tax advantage for you. Yes. And what I would say is, you know, when you're a sole proprietor, uh, the IRS really just sees you and your business as no separation. Now, from a legal standpoint, you're separate. But the reason I say that is the IRS doesn't care if you have a separate bank account. They're not going to be worried where your assets titled in the business or not. But when you become an S Corp, and this would be the same if you're a partnership or a C Corp, but when you become an S Corp, then you need to have a, a separate and distinct bank account that all income that you're planning to be taxed as the S Corp is going to go into that bank account. And then all expenses are paid out of that. If you get a credit card, then you would have a credit card that the S Corp, that bank account would pay whatever the credit card charges are. And then I, this is where uh, we get into a lot of opinions amongst tax pros and uh, CPAs and EAs in terms of now the next topic, which is having payroll to yourself <clears throat> as an owner. So what the IRS looks at, and this is where it gets into opinion, is that technically the IRS doesn't require a wage to be paid to an owner. And when I'm talking about require, I'm not talking about our emotions about it or what we think or folklore, or if the IRS were to audit, they would say, where's the wages? I'm just saying, when you go to Form 1120S and when you look at the rules and the law, there is, there's actually no requirement. And that's where then the S Corp can get a little dangerous because people look at it and they either come up with an opinion of, well, I don't have to pay myself anything. So what comes into play is that the IRS does indicate that a reasonable wage, a reasonable compensation does still need to be paid to the owner. And so with that being said, I'll just go right to, that's usually the biggest hurdle for someone deciding to be an S Corp is, well, now do I have enough money to pay myself? And do I have enough going through my bank account to pay myself regularly as a wage? I'm not talking about writing yourself a check and then the memo calling it payroll. I'm talking yeah. about yeah. through what we're getting ready to talk about. But yeah. then there's a cost to it. And really, it's almost like no matter what you're having to pay, you can search it. So like whatever you guys are charging, extremely reasonable. I know you also do some other services. 
Um, but online services where you're going through QuickBook or third party. But Mike, on this issue, that it's just some expense to it, uh, a monthly and a quarterly and annual expense because of all the things that have to be filed. So what's then a reasonable wage? Well, that's where the crux comes in. And so I really tell my clients this, a reasonable wage is first based on your cash flow. Second, it's based on availability of your cash flow. Third, it's based on, well, how much money you're actually pulling out for yourself. Because really what the IRS looks at is if you're pulling money out for yourself, well, they're going to expect some of that to be then a W-2 wage. Why? Because a W-2 wage is subject to Social Security and Medicare taxes, which magically, when we take the amount withheld, and the employer match, it's 15.3%, as we talked about earlier. It really puts you in the same position where, ah, so the S-Corp, the net income, is not subject to self-employment tax, but the IRS is expecting, let's be clear about that, they're expecting a reasonable wage to be paid based on cash flow, based on uh, need, and then that's the amount that is subject to that 15.3%. But the key is, as I tell clients, we have control over that. So let me give you some quick, and, and this is where there will be opinions all over the place. Mike, when I travel around the country, I always enjoy kind of as I'm trying to break up the day, I always ask my fellow CPAs, EAs, and tax pros, I say, hey, uh, raise a hands. You know, what net income level uh, do you think in an S-Corp uh, someone needs to start paying themselves wages. So here's what I just say. If you're showing a loss and you're borrowing money, the IRS cannot compel you to then borrow more money to pay yourself a wage. The second is, is that, you know, if you're netting 10 or $20,000, to be honest with you, uh, the IRS might look at that and go, well, I mean, you're still kind of getting off the ground. I don't know that you really need to pay yourself a wage, maybe something, six grand a year, 10 grand a year. So let's just go now to real life situations though. We're past the losses, we're past that low income. I just pretty much say up to 100,000 of you pulling money out, okay? Not necessarily 100,000 net, because what the IRS looks at is the money that you're pulling out, it's either a distribution or it's payrolls. The only two ways that you really can pull money out of an S Corp. And with that, distributions, represent the net income, which is to say it's not taxed again, unlike the C-Corp. When you pull money out, it's not a dividend, it's a distribution, which by law is not subject to an additional tax because whatever that business nets, that individual is going to pay tax on it regardless right. if they pulled money right. out. Right. So again, the IRS then looks at <clears throat> if you netted a hundred grand, but you pulled out, let's just call it 90,000 for yourself. I tell people reasonable would be 60% wages and maybe 40% would be distributions. Someone could go 30% distribution, 70%. What the IRS is looking at is that there's an effort being made and there's something reasonable. And the reason I say reasonable is I have clients, they have an S corp, they're involved but they grow the business that they don't do anything with the S Corp. I mean, they have people running it, they're expanding it. So they're really now just an officer. So we may say, well, I mean, a reasonable compensation is also based on what's your effort in the business. So we may go down and not pay all that much. It might be more like an officer. However, most small businesses, they're in there by the sweat of their own brow. They're helping to generate and manage. So then you have to look at, well, what would you expect to be paid if you were working for this business, a wage? And that might be really kind of the best indicator. Now, most small business owners, all of a sudden they go to a mindset of like, well, I should be paid a million dollars. <laughs> Great. I probably don't disagree, but it's then based on what cash flow. So here, let me just give you uh, an example. So if I have a client and they're netting hundred grand. They're going to pay tax on that hundred grand. But if they paid themselves a wage of 60000 well, then they're going to be able to deduct that wage to the S-Corp. So if somebody were to jot down, now we look at the net income after the wage to the owner of 60000 And I understand that you could have some tax pros listening, and they're going to know there's some other caveats, but we're really going to try and keep this simple. Uh, 
Yeah. So down at the individual level, they're going to pay tax on that $60,000 wage. And then now the business has a net income of 40,000 because the wage got deducted from that net income. But with an S corporation, it doesn't pay its own income tax. That owner of the S corp, we're assuming 100%, is going to now pick up that net income, which is reported on what's called a Schedule K-1, but that's gets reported down at the individual level. This is regardless if the owner pulled out any money representing that 40 grand. Right. But as you right. can tell, down at the individual level, they still paid income taxes on 100 grand. But compared to if they were a sole proprietor, what they paid that Social Security and Medicare tax on, or the 15.3%, was only on the $60,000. If they later pull out distributions or during the year, it's irrelevant because it represents the net income that they're going to pay tax on. But on that 40000 they did not, by law, by statute, pay self-employment tax or pay the 15.3 or pay the Social Security, Medicare, all the same thing. So what did they save there? Well, if I'm just kind of rounding, well, they just saved $6,000 in this tax. Then what the IRS would look at, and this is what I tell my clients, Mike, is that if you're going to pay yourself a wage of 60 grand, it needs to be regular and routine yeah. at least once a month, you know, but most likely if you're paying other employees in the same time frame in a right. very regular amount. The other part is if you're going to pull out distributions of 40 grand, I'd be telling a client, well, that represents net income and leftover dollars, if you will. So that probably needs to be quarterly. So if I have a client, it's like, oh, I can't wait that long. It's like, well, then you probably need to pay yourself more wages. And see, this is where the devil's in the details, Mike. So all the clients I work with, what they do is maybe four, maybe five, if not three, I've got some clients that only do two. And I've got a few clients that only do one distribution a year. And the reasoning for that is we don't want it to look like this is a wage. So if the IRS were to come and look, which would be the only way for them to, to be in your details this way, and they see that you're paying yourself a wage once a month, but then anytime you want, you pull money out of your business, you're paying personal expenses. The IRS goes, that's payroll. I mean, that's that's regular compensation. So we're going to reclass that and we're going to say that that's payroll. Um, and or they come in and they go, well, gosh, you're pulling out money all the time and you're just paying yourself a $24,000 wage. So where does the slippery slope come in? Well, this is where I make it simple for clients. This is how you're going to... This is how you're going to need to approach this uh, so that distributions represent net income, wages represent that dollar amount. Where a lot of, and I'm just going to be honest, I think a lot of people uh, don't then maybe spend the time with their client to talk through these things. And so the client's kind of to their own mindset of like, well, I'm paying myself a wage. I don't want to pay myself any more than I have to because I got to pay this tax. And then I'll just take distributions as, as much as I need it. But the, the, the other thing I'm just going to point out, Mike, and, and, and you'll let me know how much more we want to go into this, but <clears throat> then what we hear from the other side, which is a very good point. Well, but if you're only paying 60000 in wages, then you're only paying into a source of security and Medicare based on that because that's all you've paid in towards. So what you have to look at, and you can go to ss.gov, log in, run your own numbers, Typically, if someone pays themselves 60 grand a year, they're going to have probably hit the full max. So people have to make their own decision. But just because you pay yourself more wage doesn't always lead to more and more and more from Social Security in retirement because there's a max that people can qualify for. Sure. But most small business owners, what we have to remember is this is what are we doing in the beginning and the next step and the next step and the next step. So if somebody's now able to pull out more than 100000 to themselves, well, then we're kind of looking at, okay, we well, have more money to work with. What would then be a reasonable wage? Let's really look at what you're doing here. But Mike, I'm going to be honest with you. The client that does one distribution a year, okay, they pay themselves uh, 244000 a year to max out the retirement. Uh, they have about 10 employees. They work every day and they pull one distribution a year and it's about $1.5 million. So, the 244000 well, we've paid the max Social Security into the IRS on those wages. That's very reasonable based on what this person does. And them pulling out that huge amount once a year as a distribution, pretty clear that's not payroll. Pretty clear that's based on distributions. 
So I don't know how the IRS could combat. So it's not just always laid down as, well, the money I pull out, I got to do a certain percentage of payroll, at least in my mind. Okay. So what that requires, Mike, is that you have a relationship with your tax professional to talk it through and vice versa. A tax professional take time to talk with their client to kind of figure out what they're doing. Because I'm telling you, the client that uh, we do an annual wage of 6000 well, he has four S-corporations. And one of his S-corps, he pays himself 244000 Two of his S-corps, he doesn't pay any wages out of it because there are no wages out of it. It's completely pretty much a, a conduit in between several companies. And then the one, he's got all these employees running. He pays himself 6000 So with this, I, I know we're kind of getting beyond the step of sophistication, but I'm more kind of pointing out that you have to really look at the facts and circumstances, but hopefully I've kind of laid out enough to give some ideas of, well, when do these things come about? So, so I want to, I'm going to attempt, <laughs> I'm going to attempt to kind of recap a super simplified version. You tell me if I'm understanding it right. So I'm an entrepreneur. I've got a nice business on my hands. Uh, I'm, I'm generating $500,000 a, a year in revenue. I've got $400,000 a year in expenses. So I've got a 20% margin business. So I, I have $100,000 left over. Regardless of how I think about classifications, I've got $100,000 left in my pocket. If, I, if I'm operating as a sole proprietor, I've got to list all these details on the Schedule C for my normal individual tax return. Uh, and so I'm paying full tax on that entire hundred grand. If I reclassify to an S Corp, uh, and give myself a reasonable wage. And you, you, you took us through a bunch of nuance about what reasonable may or may not be. But assuming I'm a daily operator of that uh, $100,000, if I put myself on payroll, and so I'm, I am now a W-2 employee, and I'm getting paid biweekly like the rest of my staff for $60,000, now I'm paying you know, state, federal, normal employment taxes on that 60. Uh, but I've, and I've got another 40 that I is still income to the business. It's still taxable whether I pull it out or, or not. Uh, but that 60,000, so I'm paying tax on it, but now it is a business expense, therefore reducing my, adding to my $400,000 expenses. It's now 460,000 expenses. The business only had profit of 40,000. So what falls to my personal tax return is a smaller dollar amount. The punchline is by simply putting myself on payroll, I'm literally reducing my tax burden. I'm going to incur some additional expense because I've got to pay for payroll. I've got to have the separate bank accounts. I'm going to have a little more money flowing to my CPA. Uh, but in general, in that scenario, we're talking about a, Roughly three thousand dollar versus six thousand uh, dollar. If you got a hundred thousand profit in your business, you could be putting three grand in your pocket just from an entity classification and just simply changing the way you do your your business as is without a heck of a lot of extra effort. Am I oversimplifying that? Not at all. It was so well stated, Mike. I wish I could. I wish I could say it that simple because you said it so perfectly. The only thing I'll add is. On that forty thousand, actually, you'd save six grand because it's fifteen point three percent savings on that forty grand. So you were running a lot of detail. I'm not going to hold you to the math because I tell my own clients, listen, I'm using a calculator. All right, I'm using a calculator. But I'll, I'll just say you're you're saving that fifteen point three percent on the forty grand. So it'd save you six grand. That's the punchline. But Mike, really, with that, uh, what it comes down to is then does the client want the hassle of all that? And uh, many go, you know what? I don't want the hassle. And there's a lot of tax pros that actually say, I mean, I'd probably say 30 to 40% of tax pros would say, don't become an S corp until you're netting a hundred grand. And that's where I look and I go, boy, if we could save six grand a year, even if you netted a hundred grand forever, if you could save six grand a year for the next 10 years, 20 years, I mean, this starts to be a real dollar amount yeah. And maybe not dollars to just go out to eat more often, but maybe you're now using that because before, if you're, and I'm just going to use the term because I do it on my YouTube channel. If you're going to be lazy, you're going to be a lazy tax preparer. 
And uh, don't, don't use that on a thumbnail. <laughs> but if you're going to be a lazy tax preparer or a lazy business owner, uh, then what you're going to say is, well, I don't want all that hubbub. So I want to pay the full amount. I'm fine overpaying by six grand, if you will. And I'm not sophisticated enough. I don't think my client's sophisticated enough to take the 6000 a year and put it in their own retirement account, get the deduction for it, because at 60 grand, you're going to be putting a lot towards your own Social Security, number one. Number two, that six grand over a 30 year career, because that's what the S the Social Security Administration looks at is what were your wages over a 30 year period to get the 30 highest. So let's just go now apples to apples if people are going to really argue the point other than just getting emotional about it. So six grand a year for 10 years. What's that? 60,000. What's that over a 30 year period? $180,000. As many as people think that Social Security is wonderful. I do. I think it'll be around. I'm not any, I'm just not cynical about it. I think it'll be around for my kids. Yeah. But at the same time, most of us are not going to live much beyond maybe 10 years. I mean, for just doing national average on social security, meaning the average for a man is mid seventies and a woman a little more than that. So where's that 180,000 going to be more valuable to you up front in retirement? Whereas Social Security, which is great, it's wonderful. Everybody has different opinions on when you should take it. At the end of the day, you're going to get it at some point. But my whole thing is, is that I work with clients that by educating them, they're not lazy because they don't want to be because they want to save tax. They want to have control. And most small business owners, they want to have control. Why? Because they don't want to work for somebody else. Why? Because they don't want someone else telling them what to do. They want to have control of their destiny. Well, isn't this another way to control your destiny on this. So it just always baffles me. And I always have fun kind of sparring with those that say on the hundred thousand, uh, that would be a good point. So really what it comes down to, I spent all that time just adding a bunch of flair, but again, you, you really nailed it on the head there, Mike, and it well, comes and down to about $6,000. I mean, here's, here's kind of how I think about it. And so why I appreciate, dare I, dare I call it your wonkiness, I mean, you obviously know the stuff inside and out in, in a way that uh, the average entrepreneur never will. Um, and what I want to make sure that we don't do is that we make this sound so complex and all there, there's all these caveats and nuances that we scare people. If you're, uh, if you're a manufacturer producing widgets and you had a chance to switch suppliers, which might be a little bit, bit of a pain, but to save $6,000 a year, you, you would, you, of course you would do it, right? If you are a construct, they run a small construction company remodeling kitchens and bathrooms and you found a supplier of granite that you could charge the same to clients, but you save 6,000 the back end, that'd be a little bit of a pain. You got some new just things to switch, but of course you would do it. I think my coaching to small businesses would be form this, form that nuance here. It is complex. But that's why you have tax pros, right? That That's why you have uh, a financial advisors to, to walk you through this and take you through this. The punchline is if you have a profitable business, you're being taxed on the profit, whether you like it or not, right? Uh, so you there are major tax advantages to the tunes of thousands of dollars that go straight in your pocket by simply reclassifying to S-Corp claiming the payroll expense uh, in, in trusting your tax pro to, to, to navigate you through the process. I think it is that simple in why entrepreneurs yeah, should it. not be afraid of this. Yeah. Well, Mike, I'm going to be taking notes after this because you've given me some good language to add to some of my videos. You know, as a CPA, our training, you know, same with EAs and tax pros, you know, we know that, well, you got to do these little things. It's, you know, I get caught up in that a little bit because it's like, well, to actually do it. But but let me let me just add to what you said by saying it's actually only complex the first day, meaning right. you set up an LLC at the secretary of state. Ooh, it's scary. You got it done because you got it done in one day. What would you immediately do after that? You went to IRS.gov and in five minutes you have an EIN. Ooh, got through it. All right. Take a deep breath. What's the next thing? 
I'm going to go find these forms that somebody told me, 8832 or 2553, how? IRS.gov, search the form. And I'm telling you, I get it. If you don't know what 2553, maybe it takes you an hour, even though I can complete it in five minutes because there's only like 10 line items you actually complete. Name of the business, when do I want the S-Corp, sign it, you send it in. Then on that same exact day, you go to your bank and you say, okay, here's my LLC, here's my EIN, I want to open a bank account, you put $100 in it, you're off to the races. So thank you, Mike, because really it's only overwhelming, complicated the first day. And what the reason I even point that out is that I usually tell clients, you know, listen, just get off high center. And so you can get off high center in one day. Now, maybe with your professionals, this takes a two week process, but I'm telling you, I've had clients where we've run into some circumstances related to opportunities and we've literally walked all this through in one day because it's just that straightforward. Technically, you can do it in a morning. And then from there, your only complication is, well, I have a separate bank account. So this requires that your money go into that and your expenses right. come out of that. I never understand why that's overwhelming. And then the reason payroll won't be complicated and overwhelming is that you hire a sure or get a professional to help you. Michael, I'll just tell you this, starting at year five, so when I was 30 years old, so 20 years ago, I just told clients, listen, we're not doing payroll anymore. I want you to go to this payroll company. And if you won't, then I don't want you as a client, no offense, but I need you with a professional that I know, trust, that's gonna be able to get it done. And if you're penny pinching, you want to do your own payroll and keep up with it. The second something gets awry on that, well, then you're going to expect me to fix it. And I'm not doing any of that stuff. So the only reason I'm saying this is that the next complicated thing is the payroll, right? And, and it is complicated, but you hire the pro and it's very inexpensive compared to your time and effort. And if you screw it up just a little, the penalties where payroll companies are going to stand by it and they're, they're, they're not right. going to screw it up. All I'm saying is that the payroll company can be also set up in the one day. So I'm just telling you, over the years, literally everything I just told you we walked through in one day, well, I've had it to where then they're signed up with the payroll company day one. They got their loan day one. And then literally all of this walks through. Then after that, and thank you, Mike, because you're, you're helping me keep in mind that I do need to even simplify it in some of my videos. After that, you're doing what you were already doing. You're out getting customers, answering calls, That's right. bringing in money, paying suppliers, and it's going through some bank account. Well, it's just now this account that you set up. And at the end of the day, uh, I, 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 I'm being sincere. I appreciate the way you've that you've put this because after that initial getting off high center, you're just off to the races like you would always. Yeah, you're running your business like you otherwise normally would in – Certainly, there are CPA firms and, and, and CPAs that do payroll. And if you want to use your CPA, fine. Yeah. I, the, the goal of sure. this show is to provide the very best information we can to entrepreneurs, small businesses, medium-sized companies to, to grow. That, that That's it, plain and simple. If it also results in a sure uh, being able to serve you, that's that's a win for us. We'd, lo we'd love it. But I think the punchline whether you whether you go with Assure, whether you go with one of the big national brands, outsourcing payroll is not a new concept. They're, you're not on the bleeding edge here. This has been around for decades in calculating gross to net. You know what time did someone punch in and punch out, or you know writing a check for someone's salary. That's not hard. The taxes of payroll is what's hard and why you want to outsource it, right? And so for the expense, there's expense, but it's not much. For the little bit of expense, you're going to have an outsourcing payroll, just like the little bit of expense you're going to have in bank fees, just like the little bit of expense you're going to have at the year end paying your tax preparer uh, to file a, a, a separate return for the business and your personal return. There's some expense, but it's a lot smaller than the than the than the, than the, the gain you have from a lower tax burden. So, JJ, I think we I think we nailed it. You nailed it. Uh, Love talking to you. I learn so much from you whenever I, whenever I do. Is there anything yeah, you well, want to I, I, add to put a bow on this topic? Yeah, and I appreciate that. Uh, two things. Uh, I don't let my clients go to the national brands that everybody would probably know. I know with your company, you're somewhat sometimes behind the scenes, if you will. I know you work with a lot of CPAs. 
Uh, I really like the way you approach it. It's the customer service. And I think the difference is, is getting somebody that you're able to communicate with, which is like a sure. The other three brands, the only reason that I even say that is they're good people. They mean well, but they really lack in the customer service. And that's what's key here. And I would also then just add this because anybody that then says, well, you told me all the reasons to be an S Corp. So let me just tell you simple when you're not an S Corp. You're investing in real estate, okay? Then you wanna be an LLC taxed as a partnership. If you're not gonna be active in the business as in, I'm just, lo I'm just basically putting money into this restaurant. I don't know anything about it. I'm never gonna be in it. I'm a passive owner. Do it through a partnership. Why? Because that net income is then not gonna be subject to self-employment tax, but more key, those kind of investments, there's more requirement for flexibility with money in, money out, with loans, having losses and having basis. And with that being said, the other aspect is with a partnership, if you're actively involved and many tax pros, unfortunately, are still missing this. And I think it's going to be a top 10 easy audit target, which just means the IRS is just going to go, oh, we don't need to even come and talk to you. But if you're actively involved in a partnership, that net income is subject to self-employment taxes, just the same as if you were a Schedule C. So let's sum it up. You're making more than 20 or 30 grand. You're actively involved. You want the money that it's netting, be an S Corp. You're netting more than 20, 30 grand and it's passive. You're just doing investment, you're doing real estate. You wanna be a partnership. You wanna take this thing to the moon. You don't wanna pull money out because you just wanna sell this company, then you're a C Corp. So hopefully that's a bow related to uh, kind of overall the theme here uh, of kind of what we were talking about. Really, really well said. JJ, enjoy talking to you. Thanks so much and until next time. And to the audience, uh, hopefully, hopefully really sound advice here. Uh, we'd love to talk to you about this. Uh, if not, go talk to your financial uh, advisor, your tax preparer, your CPA, uh, and, and get moving on this topic if you haven't already. Until next time, happy holidays, everyone. Yep. At Assure, we build human capital management software and services that help 90,000 companies like yours attract, develop, and retain great people. Our low upfront costs and affordable subscription model allow you to save cash to invest in things that drive growth, not overhead. To learn more about how Assure can help you claim up to $26,000 per employee with the Employee Retention Tax Credit, automate your payroll, and build productive teams that are compliant with ever-changing HR laws, visit AssureSoftware.com.